welcome once more into the Radiopedia reading room and to a radiology podcast that is now officially one year old. Yippee! Yep. We've been doing this for 12 long months. My name is Andrew Dixon and joining me, he probably should learn to crawl before he tries to walk, <laughs> it's my co-host Frank Gaylard. Oh, hello Andrew. I'm not sure. Lying on my back quietly panting from the effort is more my style. I think crawling <laughs> is too far. <laughs> and occasionally screaming like a goat. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Now, I will say, though, that at 12 months in, I'm pleased to announce, Gaylord, the last episode we recorded, so on Malpractice with Francis Ding, that's actually proving to be our most popular one ever. Oh, wow. So we've hit our straps. That's uh, exactly how high a bar is that, really, to surpass. <laughs> But no, it was a good episode. I enjoyed doing it. I particularly like the fact that compared to even the very little preparation I do for these, I had to do even less for that one. So that was very good. But over the past couple of weeks, I have found myself doing a couple of things as a result of that episode. One of which is standing awkwardly in doorways and seeing whether I can actually spot anything from across the room, like that person said. <laughs> yeah, an abnormality on the screen. Yeah. Hmm. You know, maybe if you know what the diagnosis already is, you can. But the other one is I've caught myself staring at basilar tips quite a lot. <laughs> it yeah. actually made me realize that at no stage did I find a basilar tip thromboembolism that I would have missed by spending all that extra time. But I probably reported less as a result. So I think that's an example of where this kind of fear of missing actually has a negative effect because yeah. I could have reported another study that's currently sitting on the unreported pile <laughs> because of the cumulative paranoia about hyperdense basilar tips. <laughs> For those who, who missed out on last episode, perhaps you can go back and give that one a go too. Uh, but anyway, today's main segment, Frank, is an abdominal imaging panel discussion recorded at Radiopedia 2023, hosted by Michael Hartung from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and featuring Joe Mullineau from the University Hospitals of Leicester and Carla Goncalves from Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospitals in London. So that's what we're going to be listening to. That's a long way below hashtag below the clavicles. <laughs> I'll yep. do my best to keep up. But hey, before we get to that, I actually have a bit of below the clavicles feedback that I'd like to squeeze in. Okay. How far below the clavicles? Eh, quite a way. Do you think we can start a new podcast corner, clothes corner, or maybe Lululemon corner? Oh, no. It's not related <laughs> to that. Yes. Consider this a community announcement. So in our Christmas episode, you asked me what was the best present I'd ever received and given. And the best present I'd received were these Lululemon shorts with inbuilt um <laughs> I don't know what you call it. It's not inbuilt panties, although it kind of feels silky, <laughs> like underwear, briefs, support, whatever, like exercise mm -hmm. shorts with built in stuff. Yep. And uh, as a result of that episode, we got some feedback from Eowyn Kavanagh in Dublin, who writes, apropos the Christmas episode, these pants, and he links to the ABC Slim Fit Five Pockets Pants 32 inch <laughs> Warp Stream that's the material, warp stream, Lululemon. He says, these are perfect for work with four exclamation marks. Love the show. Eowyn. <laughs> He's probably given you like an affiliate link there. So yeah, you get a little bit is. of money if you buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I, of course, uh, got some. And you know what? They're great. No doubt. Because, <laughs> now hear me out, They're, they look mostly like Work pants, they're like sort of chino looking pants, mm -hmm. right? And I'm dressing down post-COVID. Gone are the days of ties and suits and, and they're lucky to get me in a polo shirt these days. But the thing that I've noticed is my primitive monkey brain, it's not too clever. So if it feels something slightly stretchy and exercisey on its legs, it's like, hey, I'm not at work. And the day goes much faster. So oh. these pants are guaranteed to reduce the subjective experience of work by 23%. <laughs> I've been wearing scrubs ever since yeah, COVID. No. It's been great it's because I ride to work. So it's so much easier just to pull out some scrubs, whack them on. But yeah. anyway, can we get <laughs> on to this week's episode, Gayla? Oh, if we must. <laughs> <laughs> so this panel discussion took place immediately after Joe had delivered a lecture entitled Solving Splenic Dilemmas, Imaging and Biopsy Tips and Carla, a lecture titled Post-Esophagectomy Imaging. And both of these lectures can be found where, Frank? 
Well, other than below the clavicles, I'm <laughs> guessing they can be found in the Radiopedia Abdominal Imaging Lecture Collection on our website, which uh, is free to anyone who has an all-access pass holder. And of course, most importantly, to everyone that comes from a low and middle income region. Would that be correct, Dixon? That is correct. Does you that must... sound very spontaneous? And it's very spontaneous. Unrehearsed. You've got your comfy <laughs> pants on. <laughs> <laughs> Who says I'm wearing pants, Dixon? <laughs> Camera's off. So this panel discussion ends up focusing largely on the reporting approach to incidental splenic lesions and also on the use of CT to look for post-esophagectomy leaks. So I thought I might give listeners a little background context for these topics prior to throwing to the main segment, Gaylard, knowing that many people will not have viewed the lectures prior. And what better way to give background context to them with a little game of spot the Uh. fake? (laughs) Are you up for it? Public demonstration of my lack of radiology general knowledge is one of my go-to skills. Bring it on. (laughs) All right, pantless episode of Spot the Fake. Four statements coming at you here, Gaylard. Three Mm. are true, one is fake, and your job is to... Spot spot the fake. Spot the fake. I'm taking notes. Statement one. Splenic hemangioma is the most commonly encountered solid, solitary lesion of the spleen, but compared to liver hemangiomas, they are less likely to show the typical echogenic appearance and progressive contrast filling and therefore are more likely to be indeterminate on imaging. Statement two, sclerosing angiomatoid nodular transformation of the spleen, open brackets, SANT, close brackets, is a recently recognized rare non-neoplastic vascular splenic lesion. Is it true that it shows low T2 signal on MRI and spoke wheel enhancement, allowing a relatively confident MRI diagnosis to be made? What are the chances of you having heard of a SANT before? Pretty low. <laughs> it's one of those I hate acronym titles. <laughs> Statement three, only 1% or so of incidental splenic masses in patients without a history of malignancy end up being malignant, whereas around one third of splenic masses in patients with a history of malignancy are malignant and around a quarter of splenic masses in patients who are symptomatic, i.e. you know, left upper quadrant pain or weight loss, are malignant. Mm-hmm. And statement four, the final one, core biopsy of splenic masses is generally avoided as it has a high major complication rate, particularly from bleeding, far more than that of liver and kidney core biopsies. Hmm. What do you think, Frank? So I am easily misled by you. But now that we've been doing this for a while, we're not actually playing spot the fake anymore. We're playing some kind of four-dimensional meta spot the fake chess game here (laughs) because I need to put myself in your tiny little monkey brain thinking if I was trying to trick Frank, how would I phrase a statement to best mislead Mm. poor innocent me? But of course, you know that that's what I'm thinking. So it gets very, very complicated. So I'm just going to, um, in the spirit that it's intended, I'm just going to stick to the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. (laughs) Die hard reference. Nice. Yeah, good movie. Stands up. Anyway, um, okay, so I've taken notes. Splenic hemangiomas being common and not looking exactly like the liver hemangioma. Sure, I think that sounds reasonable. Isn't the spleen normally more echogenic than the liver anyway? So it probably they probably don't stand out as echogenic. I don't know. I'm making that up. Sant, whatever, never heard of it. Um, I believe you when you say that it's been created. It would be really cruel and unusual to then mislead me on what it looks like so i'm just going to assume that that one's true it sounds a bit almost like an fnh of the spleen doesn't it anyway one percent of splenic lesions in non-cancer patient being malignant sure but i mean one percent sounds even high compared to uh what i would have guessed and when someone has a history of cancer cancer is always the answer so a third sounds about right as well and if it's symptomatic i mean sure symptomatic lesions are more likely to be bad. So I reckon that leaves me with statement four. That's a classic. We were always taught that this thing was really dangerous, but actually it's fine. Like with uh, kidney biopsies back in the day, it's like, oh, you should never do a percutaneous kidney biopsy. And now people do it all the time. And I think spleens are probably biopsyable. I think I even biopsied a spleen once upon a time. Accidentally. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, probably. We could do an entire hostful episode where I just recount the many 
and varied ways that I caused mishaps during <laughs> my attempts at pretending that maybe I could do intervention. They all, not all ended badly, but statement four is false. Okay. All right. Well, let's get into the answers here. And the way I design these, Gaylord, is actually to maximize the educational value for our uh-huh. listeners. I'm not trying to particularly trick you or confuse you or expose I'm your easily incompetence. easily confused. <laughs> Uh, so statement one, splenic hemangiomas uh, being the most common, that is correct. And they are harder to kind of diagnose in the spleen because they don't often have that typical appearance that you see in the liver. So that's correct. Uh, although occasionally you will see those typical appearances. And in those cases, you can be confident and make mm-hmm. the diagnosis. Statement two about the SANT, the sclerosing angiomatoid nodular transformation of the spleen. Yep, that's correct. It does have this characteristically low T2 signal on MRI. So it's one of those solid solitary lesions that you can kind of make the diagnosis on MRI, which is good, and avoid a biopsy. Statement three, only 1% or so of incidental splenic masses in patients without malignancy are malignant. That's correct. That's a really important point from Joe's lecture is that if you're seeing an incidental splenic lesion, patient doesn't have a history of malignancy and they don't have any symptoms, have a look around, make sure there's no lymph nodes in the retroperitoneum and things like that. But in that case, if there's nothing like that, then the chance of it being malignant is really, really low. And in most cases, you can dismiss them. We'll find out more about that in the main segment when we get to it. Whereas, yeah, if they do have a history of malignancy and they've got a splenic lesion, around one third of those splenic lesions will be malignant. And if they're symptomatic, importantly, about a quarter of those splenic masses will end up being malignant. So symptoms are important. Uh, And that leaves you to be correct with statement four, Gaylard. Yeah, so it was a bit of that because in in 1985, there was this study and it showed basically a a 60% major complication rate from doing splenic core biopsies. That's before my time, so I can't be held responsible. (laughs) (laughs) But they used a 14-gauge needle. And then there's a a nice meta-analysis in 2011 that Joe points out, and you basically can exclude that 1985 study as an outlier. All the other ones tend to use about an 18-gauge core biopsy or even smaller. And in those situations, it's really one 1.5% complication rate. It ends up being around about the same rate as a liver or a kidney biopsy. So certainly we shouldn't be avoiding doing them for that reason. So when I was a junior registrar here in Melbourne, Rob Gibson, who's well-known liver ultrasound person was and still is in our department, was teaching me how to do non-targeted liver biopsies. And after I did it, I went to have a look at the puncture site with the ultrasound. And he said, Mm -hmm. what are you doing? I said, oh, I was just wanting to see if there was bleeding. And he says, never look, never look. There's nothing you can do about it. And it always just looks terrible, especially if they've got ascites. There's this like plume of blood coming out of the liver into the ascites. He says, it's not going to change what you do. Just walk away. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, no, I had a boss who, with those non-targeted liver biopsies, would use the ultrasound to find where he's going to do it and have a look, you know, take a breath in, see where it where it sits and confirm that that's going to be the right spot. But he wouldn't actually watch with ultrasound as yeah. he did it. He'd just get them to take the, and because he could do it really, really quickly. And his yeah. theory was that the less amount of time that he had that core biopsy needle going through the liver, as long as the capsule remained stable, you know, take a breath, hold it, he'd go straight in, click, take his sample yeah. straight out. And if you're taking your time to get a perfect image on the screen and store an image, you're actually probably doing the patient more harm than yeah, good. Yeah, that's so. the way I was taught. But actually, and I know, you know, I keep saying I'm not that old, but I suppose eventually that won't be true anymore. But <laughs> when I was an intern, uh, and this is not in some crazy, you know, backwater place. This was at the Royal Melbourne Hospital in, when was it? The late 90s. I was going to say late 1900s. Like, no, like 1999 or 1998, that is the late something 1900s. like that. We were still doing non-targeted liver biopsies on the ward as an intern without mm. any imaging. And it was taught to me, and I don't know if this was how everyone was taught or whether it was just my terrible registrar that taught me this, but it was like, no, no, you, you stick it in the liver, you leave it there. Then you get the patient to take a big breath in to check Uh that it's moves in the opposite direction to the breathing so that you know that you're in the liver as it descends, you know, because if you're in bowel or something, it won't move quite like that. (laughs) And then when you have the nice big breath, then you take your biopsy and you're done. And I would have done, I don't know, dozens 
like that. And I don't remember, I didn't kill anyone. Um, but now the thought of doing it like that is petrified, but things have changed in not that long a time. Yeah, that sounds, that, <laughs> that sounds dodgy, doesn't it? Now, did you notice I didn't do any post-esophagectomy spot the fakes in those yes, four thank you gay for that. So I'll spare you that. <laughs> um, but uh, if anyone's interested in learning more about post-esophagectomy leaks, then they should check out Carla's lecture. So I guess with that background uh, covered, we probably should get into the main segment now, Gayla. So mm-hmm. this is an abdominal imaging discussion with Michael Hartung, Carlo Goncalves, and Joe Mullineau. So we'll listen in, and then Frank will be back with Pants Off for another chat <laughs> in the outro. <laughs> I am now joined by Joe Molyneux and Carla Gonsalves, and I'm excited to have a chance to chat with you further. So we'll start with Joe. I have to say I really appreciate your sensible approach to splenic lesions and your emphasis that often we are dealing with benign etiologies. In my own institution, I've noticed a movement towards working up nearly any equivocal finding due to, I think, increased concern on the patient and the provider end and maybe increased uh, vigilance over our reports and uh, looking up the findings on the internet, which I think can increase patient alarm in many settings. Uh, So that puts us as radiologists in a tough position where even if we say something is most likely benign, can still often prompt a workup. I'm curious if you have some tips about the sort of language or specific direction that you'd give to providers in the setting of splenic lesions to keep everybody on a reasonable track. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, it's it's a difficult subject. I, I suspect the approach differs between individuals, institutions, and probably globally. So it depends what kind of environment you're working in, um, whether it's a litigious environment. I'm sure that over in the States, you probably have more people looking at your reports in that way. Whereas we're not quite there in the UK, but there is a move towards that. So historically, I was often taught that if you see these things, you can use something called professional blindness and not report them at all. If you're sure that they're benign or they're highly likely to benign. And that would obviously, in an ideal world, will be great. But people can look at images, people can ask, did you look that? Did you see that? Have you missed it? So I think we're probably moving away from that now. It's more of a paternalistic approach. What I like to do is is describe them and then if I can, call them benign. So especially cystic things. We know from the ACR white paper, we can call these benign and there's no follow-up. So I don't think there's a massive problem with those. The gray area of these things that we can't fully characterize, but we know they're likely benign. In that scenario, I think from the paper, we saw that these are highly likely benign to the level that we're happy to let other things go. An example would be an adrenal adenoma. Maybe that's highly likely to be benign if you've got fat in it and we let that go quite regularly. So I think if you use the term benign, and just take that responsibility as a professional. That's your opinion. This is benign in your opinion to the likelihood level that we can see. Then I think that's reasonable. Some people may want to work these up more. And I think MRI is useful if you want that definitive answer, but most of the time you're still going to be left with the same question. The issue I have is not knowing the patient or not knowing the clinical history. And the the history we get is often poor. So I sometimes may throw this back to a clinician that if they have no other sort of features, weight loss, systemic problems, then they can probably let it go. So in truth, there's no one correct answer. And I think every individual radiologist may have different different ways of approaching this. But I, I like to describe them and use benign if I think it's benign. Long answer, but... No, I think that's a great approach. A I think it kind of, you know, this discussion actually kind of goes beyond just splenic lesions, but into incidental things in the liver, in the kidneys, and in the adrenal gland. Just, you know, how are we handling these uh, abnormalities that are overwhelmingly likely to be benign? But are we going to pass a hot potato still and say, you know, hey, you guys have to try to figure out what to do with this? Or are we willing to kind of say, this is something that can be let go in the right, in a, in a reassuring clinical context, we can let this kind of stuff go? Yeah, kind of, I agree. It's kind of quite personal, quite difficult. And I think even our own understanding of risk, because that's what we are dealing with, kind of varies. And I think kind of with kind of splenic lesions, you know, like, like the paper that you showed, kind of if you pick up kind of a random splenic lesion with nothing on the CT, you're still dealing with you know, one in two hundred chance or less of being something malignant. And it might, and it depends how people interpret that risk. 
I personally tend to let it go, but um, Joe talks made me kind of a bit nervous as well. Am I doing the right thing? But I try to put things into perspective, kind of with adrenal adenomas, we let go adrenal adenomas, you know, if they are less than, you know, 10 Hounsfield's units, and we have a specificity of 98%, not 100%. So we assume that risk and we don't question it. And sometimes you know, we don't apply that kind of to others. So I think it's really difficult. And I find it difficult to kind of try and decide. I quite like the adrenal adenomas as a good thing. You know, if you have a specificity of 98% and all of us, we are going to call it likely adenoma and don't recommend anything. Maybe we can do that with more findings. But I think it depends on kind of, you know, litigious context and so on. Yeah, it can certainly be complicated. You know, to some extent, it's like we have to try to keep everybody's focus on like the things that can really harm a patient or the things that are, you know, really going to be salient for the patient's outcomes. And I think sometimes these kind of side journeys into these like small benign lesions can be, you know, costly and anxiety provoking and, you know, on a system kind of global standpoint, um, unhelpful. So kind of finding, you know, that cross section of when, when to intervene and when to let things go and then providing that clear guidance, I think is really essential. And just, I just wanted to raise one thing, Michael, is that follow-up is not without morbidity. So you may get to a point where you try to biopsy this lesion, you can't get it at rep and sample, and they end up with a splenectomy for a benign lesion, and they're at risk of encapsulated infection for the rest of their life. So you protected yourself from anything, but are you doing your patient the good? And there's a degree of radiologists needing to take responsibility and professionalism, I believe, and just accepting that risk on themselves at, at times. That's a great point. When you kind of think like, what is the you know, often when you recommend an imaging study, if you kind of think ahead, like, am I really going to be able to characterize that on imaging or is it going to move to biopsy or something more invasive? And then is that really worth it? That's a that's a tough question. And uh, it's good to remember that there are risks to more invasive diagnoses beyond just the patient being worried before, you know, while they're waiting to get into the MRI schedule, <laughs> you know, beyond that, uh, going into uh, into procedures or even, you know, surgical biopsy or things like that, you know, it can it can really open up a can of a can of worms for them. So it's a great point. Well, we'll go on to Carla. And so Carla, I really enjoyed your discussion on esophageal imaging. In particular, in my practice, I've seen a lot of growing interest in CT for esophageal leaks, um, but also some resistance on the part of the surgeons to letting the fluoro go, if you will. So probably like the younger versus older surgeons, I've seen that you know, where the younger ones are a little more willing to hear about the new techniques and give it a shot, whereas the older ones are saying, you know, I want a fluoroscopic esophagram. <laughs> um, so I'd love to hear your experience on how, you know, our imaging algorithms and best practice that we kind of determine uh, relate to the surgeon's preferences and the tips for navigating the waters with them to deliver the best possible patient evaluation. Yeah, I think that's kind of a universal issue. All of us kind of will be faced with this in multiple areas. And I think at, at least kind of uh, at my institution, we have a really good GI group and GI and HPV. So the radiologist, we discuss things and we come to a conclusion. We as a group recommend this. And I think out of you know, experience kind of with other people accepting any change is always challenging in any area. And I think we ourselves are probably a bit resistant to change. If we think about it, I think most people are reasonable. And I think it's just trying to understand where things come from. And I think usually there's two main questions that I think people keep posing. And I think that are fair. One of them, does the literature apply to our population? Because I've been in that position where someone says, you know, ultrasound has a sensitivity of 98% for appendicitis, therefore we should use it. And, you know, I raise my eyebrow because, you know, maybe for that paper, but, you know, probably their population is a thin young population with a high pretest probability, which doesn't apply to our practice. So I think sometimes the surgeon saying, you know, does this apply to us? I think is a fair question. What we are doing now, we've teamed up with the surgeons. So we are going through kind of all the data, including, you know, surgical data and imaging data, because at least one, we have our own data. And I think it's fair enough to see, does it follow the literature? And when we are kind of working together, so, you know, we'll look at your kind of up-to-date rate of leak and we'll go over our sensitivities and specificities helps. And I think the other question comes back to the question of uh, risk. Uh, which is kind of the same we were kind of discussing just with the spleen, because say a likelihood of, of leak of 3% for me is extremely reassuring for a surgeon that might be sweating because, you know, they see the patient, you know, they have to manage it. So I, I can understand that. 
And usually for the, the risk, I think it's a really complex discussion, but usually I think about exactly what's going to happen next and think about the next steps. And I think kind of for leak is more or less clear because, you know, if we are kind of screening asymptomatic patients, even if there's a leak, most likely they are not going to have any management. So kind of when we go through the data and we are going through that at the moment is just, I want to show, look, even if there was a leak, you didn't do anything. <laughs> so do we really need to know that? So I think thinking about kind of, you know, the assessment of risk and even consider it because they might be right, I think helps. And so what are the consequences of us missing something? Go through your own data and just try and, yeah, think what's coming next and what's the consequences of us calling benign or malignant or leak or malignant will be. And if the consequences are minimal, then I think usually they tend to be more reassured. But one final thing, it needs to be in partnership. And I think as radiologists, we tend to isolate ourselves in our own rooms. At least at my institution, things got worse after COVID. Kind of, you know, there's a bit kind of a separation. We tend to block the door. And I genuinely think that harms outcomes. Uh, just in terms, you know, if people know you, you know, if you say something, they're more likely to kind of, you know, accept it if they trust you, if they work with you in the past, if they have a personal relationship. So keeping that door open to the clinical teams, it might sound very, you know, softy, softy, but I generally think it's really, really, really important. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it's interesting because you could imagine from their perspective, if they have a imaging algorithm that they think works fine, like let's say Flora is working fine, and then all of a sudden we start saying, hey, we should be doing CT. They're thinking, you know, it's not broken. What are we trying to fix here? Keeping that communication open, I think it's like, it comes down to change management too and saying, well... You know, maybe the, the discussion with them starts by saying, like, what is your perception of our post-operative, uh, post-subjectomy imaging? Are you happy with it? Is there, have there been cases that haven't gone well? Even looking at those and saying, okay, there was a missed leak in this, in this case. You know, let's look at where the leak was and kind of try to deduce, could it have been seen with CT? You know, those, those kind of things to, tr to try to, like, lay the groundwork for a different technique. But all of that has happened before. You know, it's kind of like on the basis of relationship and, and knowing people. So, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense as Hopefully we've all been opening up our doors again. <laughs> and I know we have, although, you know, it's certainly been a slow process. But <laughs> Joe, what about from your experience? Do you have any take on uh, the floral versus CT world for these post-operative patients? From, from my experience, Carla's hit the nail on the head. In our institution, we have moved entirely to CT now to the point where we hardly ever do a fluoro case. But that's all built on a relationship and a confidence that they know that the imaging will be done swiftly, reported swiftly and competently by us. I think where I've seen people not want to let it go it actually comes down to, I can look at the imaging and have an interpretation myself. I don't have to wait for a report. So a lot of surgeons were happy looking at fluoroscopy studies and the images, flicking through them and going, oh, that's fine. There's no leak. Whereas I think they find CT harder. And so they have to have more confidence in the radiology report because they don't really know what they're looking at as much or as well as they used to after years of looking at fluoro. But that relationship, I would just echo it and say, if you get the right relationship and they're confident in you, then you end up with with a good good outcome. That's a great point with uh, their, co their comfort in reviewing the imaging themselves. I didn't think about that in, in terms of even sitting down with them and saying, you know, let's go over some some techniques for interpretation for these exams and, you know, let's look at a CT together. And yeah, I love that. I love that thought. You know, while we're on this topic, I'd love to hear, Carla, maybe some pointers on your specific protocol for CT esophagram. So some places start with a non-contrast series, some just go right to having the patient drink, comments about volume and what you found works best. Yeah, so we don't use a CT non-contrast as uh, kind of our style. We just do a post-intravenous contrast study with regards to intravenous contrast. And I think just my own personal experience, I think really very few occasions I regretted not having kind of a pre-contrast. Usually the pre-contrast helps to identify the sutures. But I think if you know the anatomy and where they are meant to be, and if you window properly, I think you can identify the sutures. And so I don't think some the, the non-contrast will help much. Uh, so we just don't do it at all. And I don't really regret not having it. I think in terms of concentration and volume, it's kind of a bit of a more tricky um, situation. Usually we just have the patient drinking 
while they are kind of on the table, usually one to two cups as much as they can tolerate. So that's between 200 and 400 mils. Some patients can drink them happily. I really like when they drink lots because I think about fluoroscopy. The more passes you have, the more uh, likelihood you have that the leak will show. But that all depend on patient toleration. In terms of dilution, we used to use one in 10, but I personally find that it's not bright enough. I don't know why. I don't know how you feel. I think there's a reluctant, reluctance of using high concentrations on CT. I think in terms of risk, it's the same as fluoro. In fluoro, we just give undiluted contrast. And I think if we dilute too much, then I think it becomes not bright enough and it just gets mixed kind of with other esophageal or gastric fluid or pull-up fluid. So uh, at the moment, we try to kind of move away, get one in four, for example, one in three. I've used one in two kind of was that when I was kind of just trying to get kind of some more information. One in two might be just a bit too bright. Uh, so I think something between one in three, one in four dilution is probably good enough at 25% dilution. Can I clarify? So you always use IV contrast? Is yes. That what so I heard we too? always use okay. IV contrast. Uh, and that's kind of a good question. But usually the thing is many of the complications, uh, most of the pop complications are actually pulmonary. So the intravenous contrast will allow us to kind of look for other things. You know, is there a PE? It'll always show kind of any impairments oh, okay. with any plural enhancement. And it's just because kind of everyone is quite obsessed with leaks and understandably, but the vast majority of complications that cause the most mortality poses of ejectomy are pulmonary. So that that intravenous con contrast allows us to show us that. So we always do one single intravenous contrast. They will drink the oral contrast just before they go on the scan, have it sitting up, lie in the scanner, and we do a um, portovenous phase, CT, thorax, and abdomen. We don't really scan the pelvis. Because the question is usually, is there a leak? And most of the complications happen in the upper abdomen, the pancreatitis, the bleeds, and so on. So I think that works quite well. Yeah, the inclusion of the abdomen, is an, that's, an, that's an interesting thought too. So does somebody monitor the studies for like delayed imaging or another oral contrast bolus, or is it a single go and... Single go. So way. we just, uh, I think kind of at least w we are quite a busy institution. So I think we'll all uh, go mad <laughs> trying to kind of monitor kind of every single case. But usually we try ask the patient to drink as much as they can. And if they can't drink anymore, that's it. You know, me seeing it won't change anything. And then do one one kind of scan on a portovenous phase. We tend to report them quite quickly. But I, I don't recall recalling any patient for any question. Either kind of we just kind of use kind of our likelihood. And if there's kind of a question, usually I don't think it's true with protocol or image quality. And it might be because you have kind of redundant tissue and so on. And I don't, I don't think immediately repeating would actually necessarily give you an answer. So we are happy with just uh, one scan and you know strict protocol and then move on. And that's one of the big selling points too, right? Is that it's a throughput. It helps, you know, I don't know for your institutions, but for us, it's like we can get patients through CT a lot faster than the floral and sometimes the floral schedule is full. And so it's, you know, it's all later in the afternoon or whatever. You know, whereas in CT, you can usually get people through kind of quickly and predictably in a short period of time. So that's another one of the, I think, the big selling points for the surgeons is to know that they can increase their throughput too in their post-operative uh, assessment and, and move things along. Yeah, our turnaround for re acute reporting, a patient's reporting is one hour from scanning. So usually, I think it's kind of much quicker than actually, at least in our institution, having a slot, having a radiographer that can you know be there. Our, our practice basically reflects exactly what Carla does. We don't dilute it specifically any more, the oral contrast for, for esophagus than anything else. We try to give them a, a cup. We're not as directive as take as much as you can, which is something maybe we could look at. We tend to just give them a, a, a cup and then lie them straight down and do a just do a portal venous scan, exactly the same. No pre-contrast. And I actually, I'm the same as Carla. I don't, I've never thought, oh, I could really do the pre-contrast. If there's a leak, it's usually quite obvious. Well, I think we could wrap up with one last comment or question about your talk about the splenic lesions. So we've been talking a lot about multidisciplinary conferences, multidisciplinary approaches. And so just thinking kind of globally for people in their own institutions when they're dealing with splenic lesions, you know, do you have a tumor board or a specific kind of like multidisciplinary conference where that would be, those cases would be shunted or do they go to the most applicable conference based on the favorite diagnosis or the you know underlying patient pathology? 
Yeah, so, you know, we don't have a, a splenic MDT, and I'm quite happy we don't, because we, we seem to be drowning yeah, in MDTs. There's MDTs and boards. <laughs> I'm not everything. saying that's the solution. Yeah. Um, no, I totally agree. And But actually, where they go is quite interesting. I think it will depend where you work, because, you know, our institution, a lot go through our hepatobiliary MDT, because the surgeons usually do the splenectomies there. So there's a group that will go, and it depends what else is on the scan, I suppose. If if you're highly suspicious of lymphoma, which is the main sort of incidental lesion, you'll have other lymph nodes, et cetera, then they'll go to the lymphoma MDT. Whereas if it's more of this gray area, incidental finding, or metastasis, maybe it will go to the HBB MDT. Interestingly, it tends to get different imaging outcomes from each MDT. So if it goes to HBB, they usually get an MRI first. If it goes to lymphoma, you should get a PET CT first. It just shows there's no real good consensus of what's the best initial imaging. But um, we get there in most patients, and it depends on who's taking the MDT at the time. And, and uh, as we talked before, what level of risk they're happy to take in conjunction with the surgeon and then the patient. Which And I prefer when they go through MDT because you get all the information usually, and someone hopefully has seen the patient and knows a bit more about their story. So... If you do discuss them in the MDT, often we can come to the, the consensus, this is this is benign and we don't need to do anything. And if we do, we will probably get a PET CT first before we go ahead and do something like a biopsy. So it's useful having those MDT discussions. During I agree. I think, I think anchoring it in, a, in an established multidisciplinary conference is really important because that yeah. helps connect them with the appropriate providers, but also in the context of other maybe more pressing diseases that help to kind of bring some sensibility to the evaluation. So Yeah. <laughs> but it's useful if the yeah. radiologist just calls them benign and they don't have to come to yeah. MDT because then uh, we have yeah. less 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 to get through. That's been a wonderful discussion and uh, I've really enjoyed your talks and uh, the chance to get to hear some of your additional insights. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for having me. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you to Michael, Carla, and Joe for that interesting discussion there. All three, Gaylard, are returning mm-hmm. for Radiopedia 2024 this Excellent. July. So Joe's going to be doing a lecture on cystic liver lesions. Carla, a lecture on diseases of the appendix. So there's more than just appendicitis, Frank. Okay. Oh, there's mucoceles too. That's it. <laughs> and Michael will be doing a lecture entitled Abdominal Infections Imaging Review of Global oh, Diseases. I've seen some of his cases. He's got some amazing abdominal infection cases. And registrations are open for Radiopedia 2024 with free access for all access pass holders. And for the first time, Gaylord, you like to say this, we have AMA PRA Category 1 credits TM in italics, up for grabs. Yes, don't forget the TM. <laughs> now, as I listened to this panel discussion again today, I jotted down a few little things for us to maybe chat about, but I'm sure you did the same, Gaylord. What have you got? Yes, quite a bit, actually. And I know I mentioned this recently, including in our medical legal episode last time. But this is another example, or the discussion is another example of where if you frame the question incorrectly with a yes-no framing rather than a or, thinking mm. about the the consequences of what you do, you can end up doing the wrong thing. So in, in this case, it's like, well, would you like to know what this splenic lesion is? It's like, oh, yes, I would like to know that. We better get a diagnosis, better do a biopsy, right? But actually, in the context of everything, that's usually the wrong answer. And so you really need to frame the question not as, would you like to know if this is cancer or not? You should frame it as, would you like to know if this is cancer or not? Or take the risks of a biopsy, even though it's only 1% likely. Yeah, it's that idea. And I think Carla mentioned it as well with the post-esophagectomy leak, thinking, you know, if I do prove that there is or isn't a leak, how's it going to change? What's going to happen for the patient? And in the majority of of cases, if they're asymptomatic with their post-esophagectomy status, then you're not going to change their management at all if you prove a tiny little leak. 
And same with splenic lesions, right? If they're not symptomatic and they haven't got a history of malignancy and you're not seeing any suspicious features like lymph nodes on the CT scan, going to the next level of, of a biopsy is something that you can kind of avoid. And, and, and how you report it initially yes. is going to really bias what ends up happening with the patient. So always trying to think a few steps ahead. And I think the easiest situation for that is often to think about patient age. Mm. Sometimes I look at the age and I go, oh, there's absolutely no reason for me to mention this. It's that idea of professional blindness that you sometimes have to apply as well. I agree with that. And I think some people say that that attitude is paternalistic. And I think mm. Jenny, Jenny Huang in her talk about the thyroid imaging and due classification said that she ran into a lot of um, pushback from clinicians saying that it's not our role to ignore anything or even really comment on likelihood of anything. It's just to describe, mm. which she disagrees with. I passionately disagree with that. I think that's a terrible role for radiologists to be pushed into. In fact, going the next step and explaining likelihood and giving advice is exactly what we should be doing. And I don't think it's paternalistic to see a one and a half millimeter cavernous sinus ICA aneurysm or infundibulum in an 80 year old and not say anything. Hmm. In fact, I think that's our role. Seeing it is great, but doesn't mean you have to. It's this um, abdicating of your responsibility by just saying, oh, I'm just a abnormality detection thing and I'm just going to mention absolutely everything and not give any judgment or context. And in an 85-year-old, an extradural tiny aneurysm, even if it's an aneurysm, you're not doing anyone any good by mentioning that. And you just need to suck it up I'm happy to take the criticism of some pedant down the track who wants to point out that I missed something and it's, well, I don't know if I missed it or not, but it's not relevant and I would have done more harm by including it. But I think that's my job. And I think we do a terrible job of resource allocation as doctors generally. The incentives that we as clinicians work under, particularly in a medical legal framework, are all geared towards doing the most and the best in inverted commas for your patient and not missing things. And the result of that is that we often do way too much because of the fear of litigation and this fear of being seen to have missed something and the fear of, you know, oh, there's a 1% chance this might not be benign. So we need to, to check it. Uh, and it's just crazy. And the talk about the splenic lesions is a perfect example of where I think radiologists can really put a break on that craziness. I really like the talk about taking responsibility and putting in the report likely benign, which I don't know, likely benign doesn't even sound that, that firm. I've started putting things in my reports like this does not need follow-up. Yep. Do you do that sort of thing? Often, particularly if it is a follow-up scan. So you've got a, a case where it's a finding that I wouldn't have followed up in the first place. And then they're coming yeah. in for a follow-up. And I would say, you know, this does not require further follow-up to try and mm. stop that kind of yearly scan happening for, for absolutely no reason. I'll use words like likely benign or almost certainly benign mm. to try and dismiss things and, and avoid it going down the wrong path. It feels a bit confronting to say, you know, almost certainly benign because the immediate knee-jerk response that your monkey brain has is, oh, but it could be malignant. What if I'm wrong? Right. Yeah, but even if it is, almost certainly benign is, is still a correct statement. It's correct, but also what do you want? Like you can't do better than that. And the alternative is are you going to biopsy every thyroid and every spleen and every liver lesion? You know, that medical student, ah, but can you exclude malignancy? It's like, no, go away. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of other little things I've written down here. Yep. One was separation since COVID and the other one mm. was drowning in MDTs. So maybe the COVID is interesting. I, I have still found that even a couple of years afterwards, there is still a little less cohesion between different subspecialties in radiology at my department yep. and also between different specialties. Yep. Some people still not turning up to a physical meeting and just logging on to Teams or, yep. or Zoom. What's your experience, Caleb? Yeah, I, I think the same thing. A lot of my colleagues got used to reporting from their offices. Before mm -hmm. COVID, most of our offices didn't have workstations and we were all in communal reporting rooms. Then during COVID, 
we got extra workstations and redeployed them. And so now every office has a workstation and, you know, it's more comfy, right? You've got your coffee, you've got your music, you can sit in there and you don't need to be worried about being distracted by people wandering in. And uh, it's tempting to just stay in there. And, And most of us are making an effort and it is an effort to go back to the communal reporting rooms. But I think it's super important, not just from a cohesion point of view, but from a teaching point of view. You don't teach Mm. well by just editing someone else's report and occasionally giving them feedback. You miss that entire teaching aspect of leaning over and pointing at something, you know, trivial or asking a question or hearing how someone senior to you phrases things or goes about discussing things with colleagues. So I, I think it has had a persistent effect and almost entirely negative i agree draining mdt is maybe we'll skip that one because i'm sure we'll discuss that (laughs) another another podcast anyway um have you got anything else to chat about it was mentioned that internet searching increases patient distress which i completely buy because of the all caps emails (laughs) that i get from talovians and um kiarians but it made me think, you know, maybe Radiopedia is a, a source of distress for lay people. We, we make no efforts to make it lay person friendly. In fact, we kind of go out of our way to not make it lay person friendly. We don't have summary sections We're using non-medical words. You know, it is just purely aimed at radiologists. But we know that lots of non-medical people visit Radiopedia. Mm. And it just makes me wonder, is there something we could be doing to reduce stress or inform lay people without changing the flavor of it? Um, Probably not, but it did make me wonder how many people get pineal cyst and then type it into Google and then come on Radiopedia and then see these massive ones and talk about, you know, pineal apoplexy and surgery and treatment and uh, freak out. I think Radiopedia is going to be the least of people's trouble. It's probably true. When they're Googling their medical diagnoses. If they do end up on Radiopedia, it's probably a blessing, to be honest, if because yeah. there'll be a lot of other websites out Facebook there. Facebook groups and Reddit. And... That will deliberately mislead and scare. Yeah. All yeah. right, well, we better wrap this uh, episode up. Gaylard, how can people get in contact with us? Well, we're at Radiopedia on Twitter and Instagram, as well as at Frank Gaylard and at Dr. Andrew Dixon. And... Even better, you can email us at podcast at radiopedia.org with any ideas and feedback or clothing tips. Yeah, and if you know what the spleen actually does, then let us know, uh, (laughs) other than bleed and enhance funny on the arterial CT. Yeah, let us know. What does it do? And if you want to help support Radiopedia, then you can become a paid supporter via the website or purchase an all-access pass to our online courses and conference and importantly, in doing so, you'll be helping us to give free access to the course as, and the conference to people in 125 low and middle income countries. And Ready Pay 2024 is going to be fantastic. Massive. And, and what else can people do to help us out, Frank? Well, you can also help by leaving a five-star review in the podcast app of your choosing. Absolutely. Let's wrap it up. So we'll catch you all again sometime soon. In the reading room now, one year old. (laughs) Stay rad, everyone. Stay rad. Stay rad. Stay professionally blind as well. (laughs) (laughs) I can do that. (laughs) 